Good morning all of you and uh, welcome to the last lecture of this course. Um, most of you must have been quite happy and relieved also <laughs> that uh, you know you have to go through a lot of assignments I know and also computer assignments as well as uh, detailed derivations probably putting lot of effort compared to the other three credit course. But, uh, um, this is a course where you learn by applying you know. So, I mean the classroom lectures are just uh, kind of helping you to understand in a broader sense, but uh, as long as you solve a particular problem yourself you will not be understanding because we have so many different types of problems in convective heat transfer. It is not a one particular type of solution and then you just change the boundary conditions. Um, and then you find uh, you, know, you know different equation solutions and so on. So, we have external flows where we have a particular type of solution and then internal flows altogether again different regimes you see how. So, it ends up from starting from a simple um, you know uh, integral equation all the way to solving a PDE anything we can do within the internal flows ok. And again when we are talking about natural convection again the solution methodology changes because you have coupling of uh, heat and mass transfer right. So, then we same method the approximate solution or for example, the similarity solution when we apply it to natural convection has to be slightly modified the kind of unknowns that we are dealing with. Again when you talk about turbulence it is uh, altogether different it looks way dif different from the kind of analysis we have applied to the laminar boundary layer equations. We have not looked at any similarity solutions in turbulent flows. So, whatever was possible um, in terms of simple analogies you know we have been trying to derive. So, you know in that sense uh, this course convective heat transfer has lot of things to be covered you know. So, it is a it is quite a bit of challenge for me also and uh, to make uh, justice to this course and still uh, in spite of that we have not covered topics like. Uh, you know porous media convection in porous media then we have uh, phase change condensation and boiling. So, these are also parts of uh, you know really speaking convective heat transfer, uh, but I would say suggest that uh, you know we since in our um, department we are also offering specific courses related to those topics you know such as uh, boiling and condensation porous media. So, anybody who has taken this course now should be able to easily um, you know uh, get on with get along with those courses as well because the, the foundation has been uh, very well established. So, the rigor will be more or less similar it is only you are just changing the approach a little bit when you do it for porous media for example ok you have additional resistances which which have to be counted for. Boiling and condensation is also highly empirical subject. So, the kind of analytical solutions are very limited to extremely simple cases especially in condensation in case of boiling you cannot find any analytical solution more or less everything has to be empirically um, you know um, um, there is not, not even a rigorous derivation, um, but um, the thing is the physics of boiling is very complex. So, there is a combined heat and mass transfer, so, so far we have not looked at mass transfer in this course. Um, again when we say convective heat it is also convective heat and mass transfer there is a there are cases where you know mass transfer is an analogy to heat transfer just like we are doing an analogy between heat and momentum through Reynolds, Prandtl all these analogies. So, we are solving the flow field and finding the heat transfer solution same way we can also find an analogy between heat transfer and mass transfer. So, we introduce another non dimensional number called the Schmidt number which is the ratio of momentum to mass diffusivity and once we know this then once you know momentum diffusivity you can extract the mass diffusivity and a similar kind of analysis instead of Nusselt number we define a Sherwood number things like the mass transfer coefficient instead of heat transfer coefficient. So, it becomes very similar instead of Prandtl number you have a Schmidt number which becomes the uh, governing parameter there. But there are cases where the heat and mass transfer gets coupled that is a good example is the phase change evaporation for example. 
So, in evaporation you also remove certain amount of mass from one phase and uh, you know add it to the other phase. So, that becomes more complex. Now, when you couple heat and mass transfer you cannot find analytical solutions again. Okay. So, that uh, requires a very rigorous uh, treatment even numerical solutions are um, kind of uh, you know hand waving approaches you know whatever we have uh, you know in the commercial um, um, computational fluid dynamics packages and so on. So, they are not very rigorously established models and uh, we are still elu elusive okay. So, I mean um, so boiling and condensation in that sense it is a, it's a highly empirical subject you have to deal with a lot of correlations and uh, experiments which have been conducted and the understandings of that okay. So, yeah overall this, this is a very vast course you know. So, um, uh, I think um, it is really hard to cover all these topics in one semester. If at all can be done, but it, it can be done, but uh, you will not be able to appreciate the depth of this subject, you know. So, uh, which I, I think already most of you are aware of the breadth of this uh, course. So, when you ta take a heat transfer course, I am sure you are exposed to the breadth of heat transfer, but unless you probe deep into a particular topic, you will not be able to appreciate the fine aspects of uh, uh, finding rigorous solutions especially analytical solutions okay. So, when it comes to turbulence again people have different approaches to it um, uh, my personal approach is also I do not uh, look for analytical solutions everywhere, but you should understand that for certain problems there are analytical solutions available which you should not overlook okay. For example, I have seen cases where people solve the flat plate boundary layer numerically and they do not know where to look for the Blasier solution to validate okay. So, you should know now by now for which cases you can actually compare with exact solutions. Even when you talk about turbulent fl flat plate boundary layer. So, we have correlations derived from approximate methods okay. In the last class I was talking about the use of analogy Reynolds analogy. So, in that case we have established an empirical relation for the skin friction coefficient right. So, if you if you remember what was the relation for C f. So, this is the this is an empirical one okay this we cannot rigorously derive this okay this is coming from set of experiments okay for the hydrodynamics part. Do you remember what this correlation is? 0 0.046 into now when we define RE now rather than defining it as RE because RE you might actually uh, misinterpret the length scale used. So, here it is whatever U m or U infinity depending on whether this is an external or internal flow. If you are dealing with external flow you have U infinity and then the length scale is now the boundary layer thickness divided by mu. What is the minus point? Point 0.2. So, this is a kind of most commonly used relationship for internal flows it becomes easier you replace your delta with d right and then the next step is if suppose you take the case of internal flows. The simplest analogy that we have derived so far is the Reynolds analogy right which considers the entire boundary layer to be purely turbulent okay. So, for this case Reynolds analogy what does it say? your standard number is equal to C f by 2 for this in this case you are actually neglecting the role of molecular diffusivities compared to the turbulent diffusivity which you know that for there is an influence of molecular Prandtl number even in the turbulent 
Nusselt number case because this is a wall phenomena and near the wall the molecular diffusivities cannot be neglected, right. So, therefore, Colburn extended this Reynolds analogy to also cases where he considers the effect of molecular Prandtl number, okay. Then it becomes the Reynolds Colburn analogy and what does it say? Your Stanton number times P r power 2 by 3 is equal to C f by 2. Now, when we substitute the expression for C f into this, therefore, we find we can derive an expression for the Nusselt number. Do you remember what it is? 0 0.0. 2, 3 times R e d power 0.8 P r power 0.3, okay. So, this is called the Dieter's mold. Dieter's bolt, okay. So, Dieter's bolter correlation, many people think uh, it is a completely uh, you know based on empirical formulation, it is semi empirical. You can say that this skin friction coefficient is empirical, but after that we use the Reynolds analogy to get this. And again in the textbooks there is a variation of exponent of Prandtl number for heating we use value cooling we use 0.4. So, but it does not matter overall the structure of this comes from the Reynolds analogy, okay. So, then it has been slightly modified depending on the heating or cooling case because the Prandtl number dependence is not a very exact dependence. It has been introduced later on by Colburn, but uh, it depends whether you have a heating or cooling that has been shown to be a slight difference, but not too much, okay. Some people use an average value of 0.33 and they are still okay with that, right. So, now for the external flows, however, you have in terms of the boundary layer thickness delta right which has to be first determined because we know that in, in the external flows boundary layer thickness delta itself is a function of Reynolds number. So, therefore, we cannot simply define Reynolds number based on delta and stop here. So, we have to therefore, how do we do this? We have to use the approximate methods, okay. So, the only way to find delta as a function of the local Reynolds number is to use the approximate methods and then substitute this for the wall shear stress and then we will have an exp expression for delta and then we apply the Reynolds analogy then we find the Nusselt number correlation. So, there also you will have something similar except that this constant gets slightly modified and the Reynolds number dependence still remains the same only this becomes a local Reynolds number, okay and the Nusselt number also becomes a local Nusselt number. Now, because in the external flows your boundary layer thickness keeps varying. So, therefore, the Nusselt number and Reynolds number have to be defined based on the local coordinate, okay. So, from this uh, you can understand even for internal flows in the laminar case your Nusselt number was constant in the fully developed region, but uh, what this says is that even if it is fully developed in the turbulent flow, this is still a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number, correct. Because what is fully developed? It is only the turbulent boundary layer. When you say these two boundary layers, these are the turbulent boundary layers. So, only these are merging, but the viscous sub layer will not merge. This is very close to the wall, it will it will not merge, okay. So, therefore, there is an influence of Reynolds number now, because Reynolds number controls the amount of this viscous sub layer thickness, okay, which in turn affects your Nusselt number. So, although your turbulent boundary layers are fully merged, your viscous sublayer is still remaining which is now governed by 
a value of Reynolds number and therefore that comes into the expression and so is the case. Now since this is a heat transfer case Prandtl number will also be important okay. So please remember that in the turbulent fully developed flow you do not have a constant value of Nusselt number like in the laminar case. The laminar case does not depend on Reynolds and Prandtl number because you have only laminar boundary layer once it is merged there is no effect of what you are putting upstream whatever Reynolds number may be once the two boundary layers are merged you will have the same profiles and only thing that will decide the Nusselt number will be boundary condition whether it is a constant wall temperature or constant heat flux only that alters the nature of the temperature profile whereas in the turbulent case still this is dictated by the Reynolds and Prandtl numbers okay. So this is a very popular correlation you know so you find in most of the engineering applications people use the Ditas Volter correlation without having to worry what is the accuracy of this how it has been derived and still it gives a reasonably good prediction within something like plus, plus or minus 15 to 20 percent of the experimental data right. So within uh, for simple flows like pipe flows you know uh, flat plate boundary layers the people have been successfully using this right for more complex flows they have to look at uh, numerical solutions. There is also uh, um, we should uh, however you know we should look at modification to the basic analogy okay we know that although this is a very useful analogy widely used but nevertheless since this considers the entire boundary layer as turbulent it is not the most accurate representation of the turbulent pro boundary layer profile. So we have seen that uh, that the entire turbulent boundary layer profile can be divided into three regions so if you plot u plus and y plus and y plus on a log scale for example right. So for example if you are talking about so you have 5 here um, you have something like 50 let us say you have 100 let us say this is like 500 and so on. So based on this we have identified a, a profile in the viscous sublayer which is linear plotted on a logarithmic x axis becomes a curve like this okay. So and then we have another expression for the log layer which is extending above y plus of 30 okay. So that can actually if you extend it it goes something like this. okay and here it is given as a logarithmic profile so do you remember how the profile looks plus a constant and this is your von Karman constant which is 0 0.41 and this is 5.5 okay this too we have derived from the basics okay now also there is a patching layer which has to be connected between the linear and the logarithmic variation another logarithmic profile so this is called the buffer layer okay so also represented with the logarithmic variation you remember what the profile is 5 y plus minus 3.05 so this is your buffer layer. So this is valid for y plus greater than 5 less than 30 right this is valid for y plus less than 5 and this is valid for y plus greater than 30. These are all kind of you can really measure the viscous sublayer and the log layer very clearly okay when you 
when you have a very very fine probe which can resolve the viscous sublayer you can actually measure and show that uh, the data also falls with these. So, this has been generally well accepted. Again variations will happen when you have pressure gradients whether when you have flow separation okay, then when the boundary layer itself is detached. So, then the this kind of profiles will not be there. So, according to the Reynolds analogy we altogether neglect this and only consider the entire turbulent log law, log law profile okay. and then we make use of the calculations of you know turbulent wall shear stress and also the um, heat flux everything to be having only one component which is nothing but the turbulent diffusivities. We integrate it all the way from the wall to the edge of the boundary layer okay. we ignore completely the molecular diffusion and then we derive the Reynolds analogy. So, naturally the next extension to this, this is called Prandtl Taylor. So, I am not really sure about uh, who really did it, but uh, looks like uh, it has been also named after uh, G. I. Taylor. So, it should have been um, I think uh, maybe a joint kind of uh, intuitive discovery of both Prandtl and Taylor. Um, so, it has been credited to both of them. So, in this case the, the point is that we assume a two layer model where the inner layer which is the viscous sub layer is also considered which is the important thing you know the molecular diffusion has to be dominant near the wall it cannot be ignored. So, therefore, so we consider the viscous sub layer and we consider the rest of the boundary layer to be turbulent. So, when we draw the velocity for example, as a function of y and also the temperature. So, we will have a variation like this for example, so till a certain location so let me let me give it a much uh, yes okay. so till a certain location this will be dominated by viscous effects from the wall and from this point let us call this um, ul where it transitions from a laminar sub layer to a fully turbulent layer okay the corresponding thickness of the viscous sub layer let us call this as delta l okay so above this the profile becomes governed by fully turbulent diffusivity right and finally at the edge of the turbulent boundary layer okay so you reach the velocity which is either the mean velocity inside the duct or it is a free stream velocity in the external flows okay. So, this is at um, delta right. So, therefore, now you have two regions one is your viscous sub layer and the other is your turbulent boundary layer. Similarly, if you draw the temperature profile something like this. So, your temperature profile is governed by again let us say till up to the laminar sub layer you have a value which we will call T L okay. and from that it becomes fully turbulent and then outside it reaches the value T M. So, this is your temperature variation with y and this is your velocity variation with y. So, this is the picture of a two layer model uh, which was which was used by Prandtl to derive the two layer analogy. So, naturally the assumption here is that So, we are picturing the entire 
within the turbulent boundary layer is divided into two layers okay one is the viscous sublayer near the wall and we have the turbulent boundary layer outside okay and again when we derive it we also use condition that turbulent prandtl number is equal to 1 so when we say turbulent prandtl number is equal to 1 we say that your delta is equal to delta t okay because even though if you assume turbulent prandtl number is equal to 1 all the processes at the wall are governed by the molecular diffusion okay so therefore the assumption of delta t is equal to delta outside will not affect what is happening near the wall okay so the same thing was is also used in the reynolds analogy right so in the reynolds colburn analogy also we use turbulent prandtl number equal to 1 and then then only we derive the analogy okay so the assumption is that inherently this is not bad and especially when we are doing even turbulence modeling most of the time we assume this turbulent prandtl number to be close to 1 okay so the starting point of this is now we have the shear stress which has now both the molecular and the turbulent diffusivities so we can write this as mu plus mu t into du by dy and similarly the heat flux also consists of minus k plus kt dt by dy okay so if you are looking at reynolds analogy it assumes fully turbulent so therefore we neglected mu compared to mu t k compared to kt and then we did divided we integrated from the wall to the boundary layer and then divided one over the other and then we ended up with this so now we have divided this into two re regions so we will first apply um, this for region 1 which is the laminar viscous sub layer okay so within the laminar sub layer can you integrate let us say equations 1 and 2 within the laminar sub layer where we can neglect the turbulent diffusivities integrate your velocity and temperature profiles from your wall till the edge of the laminar sub layer delta i <coughs> and then take the ratio of 2 by 1 so that is the heat flux divided by shear stress first integrate it and then you divide it so what do you get if you do that what will happen to tau so at wall it becomes tau wall right and it be, this is a mu t is neglected you have mu and then the u gets integrated from 0 all the way to u l okay and y all the way from 0 to delta l the same way here also you have q wall and this gets integrated from t wall to t l and then this is also 0 to delta l and then we divide 2 by 1 so delta l gets cancelled so essentially we will have therefore q wall divided by tau wall is equal to minus k by mu into t l minus T wall by U L. Okay, so therefore we can write this in terms of uh, molecular prandtl number. 
multiply and divide by Cp. So, mu Cp by k, so we can therefore write this as Cp divided by frontal number. Okay. So, let me call this as equation number 3. So, now next we will apply um, equations 1 and 2 in the turbulent boundary layer. Okay. So, for turbulent boundary layer, we can of course do the other approximation where the turbulent diffusivities are much larger than the molecular diffusivities okay. and therefore, we can integrate from delta L all the way till delta. right? So, you do the integration of these profiles from delta L all the way till delta and then divide again 2 by 1. Okay, let us see what, what is the expression that you get. So, let us say again you have q double prime by tau will be equal to minus C p into T m minus T l divided by Prandtl number into u m. So, where do you have Prandtl number here because this is turbulent. So, this is yeah, P r t is equal to 1. So, therefore, we can write it. So, therefore, now we have this is your equation number 4. So, for continuity the same wall shear stress or wall heat flux has to be taken all the way from the wall to the edge of the turbulent boundary layer. Correct. So, we are right now assuming a one dimensional transport of heat. So, whatever you apply at the wall has to be transported all the way till the edge of the boundary layer. So, therefore, this has to be the same as the wall quantities here. Correct? There is no discontinuity in the heat flux or shear stress. It will also be felt by the turbulent boundary layer, same with the wall shear stress. Okay. So, therefore, we can just replace q and tau with q wall and tau wall and now the unknown quantity in this we know for example, for a given isothermal condition we know what is the wall temperature T wall, okay. but what we do not know here is T L the temperature at the edge of the laminar sub layer. Okay. Now, U L is also obtained from measurements. Okay, we will see how do we get it, but when we are solving the heat transfer problem T L is difficult to obtain. So, therefore, we will elim eliminate T L by using these two equations. So, therefore, eliminating T L between 3 and 4. So, how do we do that? We just add 3 plus 4. So, if you add 3 plus 4, you have minus C p, you have plus C p T l, there you have minus C p T l. So, the T l gets eliminated right away. Okay. So, therefore, you please do 3 plus 4. If you do that, so you will be ending up uh, with the following expression, which is uh, q wall double prime by Okay. So, I just take this to the left hand side okay, and then this also to the left hand side and then I add 3 and 4. 
So, on the right hand side I have C p into T ball minus T m. Okay. So, this is let us say equation number 5. In this case the T l is eliminated. So, what I ask you to do now that we have something like q all by tau all, okay, you can take this tau all to the right hand side and write this in terms of Stanton number. Okay. So, if you write this in terms that means q all by T all minus T m is nothing but h h by rho C p into u m is your Stanton number. So, write this in terms of Stanton number on the left hand side, take the other extra terms to the right hand side and see what kind of expression you get. Okay. So, you should be able to get an expression for Stanton number is equal to function of the other terms including Prandtl number. So, now this entire term here is Stanton number. So, q all by t all minus t m is h divided by rho c p u m. Okay. So, your Stanton number therefore is equal to now what I am going to do is multiply and divide by u m. Okay. So, therefore, I will have tau all by rho u m square is nothing but your C f by 2. Okay. So, this is your C f by 2 and when you take u m common, so you have Prandtl number into u l by u m correct plus I have I will just rewrite it. One plus u l by u m into until number minus 1. So, finally, I end up with a relation between Stanton number and C f and you see in this case naturally the Prandtl number is coming. So, I am not forcing Prandtl number to come in like the case of Reynolds Colburn analogy. Since we have not neglected the viscous sublayer we have also considered that. So, naturally the Prandtl number is built in inside this analogy. right? So, now the only thing that needs to be closed is u l by u m. So, u l by u m actually is uh, measured for turbulent flows, turbulent boundary layers and we have some correlations for that. Now, let us see for the case of a circular duct for example. So, the u l by u m is expressed as a function of the C f written as 5 into square root of 1 by 2 C f. So, this is the kind of correlation. Okay, let us call this as uh, equation number 6 and this is number 7. So, if you plug in equation 7 into 6, so you get the expression for a circular duct you get the analogy C f by 2 divided by 1 plus 5 times C f again into Prandtl number minus 1. for example. So, this is the analogy for the circular duct. Similarly, if you are talking about maybe a rectangular duct, you will have a different relation between u l by u m and C f which you will substitute and get the final analogy. Okay. So, therefore, once you know the C f, we can use the previous C f that we have written down okay, 
for the Reynolds analogy that can be used substituted here and we can find an expression for Nusselt number right. So this is how the Prandtl Taylor analogy is developed. So for the case limiting case where Prandtl number equal to 1 so where we have a fluid which is having a Prandtl number exactly equal to 1 the molecular and a molecular laminar and the thermal diffusivities are identical. So what happens to this reduces to the Reynolds analogy. So in this case this gives you that Stanton number is equal to so you see that Reynolds analogy is not bad after all especially when your Prandtl number is equal to 1 that is your molecular Prandtl number equal to 1 Reynolds analogy is the correct analogy because all the complex analogies are finally collapsing to that okay it only makes a difference where your molecular Prandtl number is either la very large or very small that is when you start deviating from the accurate results. So most of the gases you do not have to worry so you can actually therefore most of the gases you will find Reynolds analogy it is reasonably accurate whereas if you apply it to very large Prandtl numbers or very small Prandtl number liquid metals and so on very small Prandtl numbers. So then you will find that Prandtl analogy is more accurate than Reynolds analogy is that clear. So, so this is a more complex expression naturally so the final uh, case will be to consider all three layers including the buffer layer right. So if you also consider the buffer layer then you are tracking the transition more accurate. So I will not derive that but I will only give you the final analogy. So this three layer analogy is called the von Karman analogy. So finally the most complex analogy that you can derive. So this is based on the three layer model which includes the laminar the fully turbulent and the buffer layer and this case the expression for the final expression for standard number for the case of circular duct okay. So you have the same term till now till now this is the same as the Prandtl Taylor analogy okay now the additional term comes because of the buffer layer so this additional term is coming in due to the buffer layer okay so this is the difference between the two analogies and again for the limiting case of Prandtl number equal to 1 what happens same this becomes 6 by 6 so ln of 1 0 this again becomes 0 so you have cf by 2 so finally it collapses to the Reynolds analogy again right. So for more complex cases where none of these analogies will work okay so we cannot find a simple analytical solution again then we have to use numerical solutions for heat runs okay. So we will kind of stop here. Uh, because uh, although turbulent heat transfer involves a lot of modeling I do not want to talk about in detail because uh, these are covered in other courses related to turbulence modeling and so on where you can learn how to use uh, different models for different problems and they are also available in many of the uh, numerical solvers okay. So we can you can also go through those documentations try to understand which kind of turbulence model work for uh, different kinds of problems. Now practically when you are working with turbulence 
uh, you will not be using too many too much of analogies so most of the complex engineering problems uh, cannot be solved with analogies so there you have to find numerical solution so you will be using some kind of turbulence model right okay so we will um, i hope that you know i could cover with with the, with the limited number of hours um, at least some overview of, about uh, turbulent heat transfer okay thank you so much